Ah, some of you know the term performance review, right? How many of you have experienced per, uh, performance reviews? Raise your hand. Okay. Um, how many of you enjoyed going through the performance review? Raise your hand. <laughs> see, see how the numbers went way, way down? Uh, you know, I can tell you from our own family of experience, all right? Uh, Pat always got great performance reviews, but she never looked forward to them. They were anxiety-filled, and, you know, um, they, they, I, I think part of, part of the written or unwritten rules about performance reviews, you've got to find some area that they want to suggest improvement. Um, and so even if you're doing well, you know, they've got to come up with something. And I think this is the work of the industrial psychologists who uh, do all these psychological things about the workplace, and then they've got to try to figure out how to help. But uh, over the years, I've seen how these reviews keep changing and new theories come and go. So it's at best an, 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 an exact science, um, especially that one about you know where to improve, right? Uh, because it's usually in an area that you don't do so well in. Uh, you're naturally not drawn to this. You're naturally uh, maybe um, unskilled in this. You know, uh, there are certain, we're all made up different, and there are certain things that we're naturally um, good at and some things that we're just deficient in. For example, in the physical, I'm deficient in fast twitch muscles. Okay, that's why I'll never be good at basketball. Uh, but I'm good at endurance, and so that's why I do marathons. <laughs> you, you just have to put one foot in front of the other, and you don't have to respond to anything. Uh, anyway, uh, so, so these performance reviews we don't like. Well, guess what? Someday, every person will face God in a judgment day. Okay, <laughs> so if you think it was hard to go through that performance review, think about having to look God in the eye and give an account of our lives. And you know, deep down inside, regardless of how good that we've tried to be, you know, we always have some trepidation. What if there's something I didn't do that I should have done? What are some things that I know that I struggle with? And so, you know, it can be very anxiety-provoking, and sometimes more so than others. Um, I remember as a young teen, and I was at church, and the youth worker was giving a message about judgment. And I still remember his illustration. He says, someday, when you stand before God, God's going to put up this big movie screen. You know, movie theater screen? Well, back in those days, those movie theater screens were huge. Okay, they weren't multiplex, they were huge. They weren't IMAX, but they were pretty good size. And he says, and God's going to put everything you've ever done on there. <laughs> I remember sitting there thinking, oh, I don't want that, you know. Um, and so uh, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't good. Uh, as as good a person as your pastor is, I've had some bad moments, like the first time I got sent to the principal's office. I was probably somewhere between seven and eight years old. And we were walked to school, and we walked by the railroad tracks. And one day, somebody had discovered that one of the boxcars that was sitting there they had locked it. So the guy opened the little chute. You know what came out? I didn't know at the time, but it was popcorn, unpackaged popcorn. So there was this mound of unpopped popcorn. So all the rest of his kids, when we come up, 
we have to try it out too, right? Well, somebody snitched on us, and we all got sent to the principals. Um, I remember another time, even younger. See, even when you're young. I was probably about four, and I was left out all on my own because my parents were working. And I was in the backyard, and I was bored, but I had found this box of matches. Yeah. You guys, you know exactly what I did, right? So I was testing it because boys and fire, we love it, right? And so I threw it, and at the moment I threw it into a safe place, a gust of wind came along. Next thing you know, the tall grass that had not been cut by the barn caught fire. Now, Jerry, you want to put your fingers in your ear? Because that barn had chickens. Okay, uh, before you knew it, because of the dry wood, that thing was gone. It was evaporated along with the chickens. And, uh, you know, it's at least some sort of a misdemeanor or felony. Anyway, so, so uh, as a, the youth minister was speaking, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, oh, no, you know, thinking about each of those chickens. Um, okay. Good news, good news in today's passage. There is that section that we're going to come to that says that we can have no fear. This is not a Nike slogan. This is not an Adidas slogan, but this is right from the Bible, no fear. In fact, It not only says that we will have no fear, but on the positive side, we can have confidence in the day of judgment. Now, I wish my youth worker had included this section, but he didn't. So I went home feeling miserable. I don't want you to go home feeling miserable. A confidence, that's pretty nice. Some of you raised your hand. You said you didn't have problems with performance review. And the reason if I asked you is probably because you knew that you were acing it, that you were doing a good job, you know? Um, I want you to think back. When's the last time in moments of judgment, whether it's performance review, whether it's an exam, whether it's when you got to get up and give a performance, uh, do a piano recital, uh, whether you had to make a presentation to the uh, group um, or in college. Um, you know, these are all little judgments. And you had that sense of confidence. I remember seventh grade geometry. Going into the final exam, I had the highest composite score that the teacher could ever remember. You think I look forward to the final? I loved geometry, and I understood geometry, and I was good at geometry. See, that was the last time I had that kind of sense of confidence. Think about it, because I'm going to ask you to share with your neighbor. When was the last time you had that sense of confidence. For some of you, when you had to do a piece of woodwork, or some of you, when you had to do something athletic, uh, for some of you, when you had to present that meal to your in-laws, whatever it is, when was the last time you had that sense of confidence? Because I want us to feel that before we go into the passage. Sometimes we're just too much only in our head, And it's meant to also touch our hearts, okay? So even if you have to go back to the seventh grade or further, further back, think about the last time you felt that confidence. Who needs more time? I always ask that, but everybody's afraid to say, I need more time. (laughs) Okay, turn to your neighbor and just tell them, when was the last time you had that feeling of confidence, all right? Find a partner and share when it was it. 
Daniel, maybe the last time you competed with a bow and arrow. Okay, give it five more seconds. Five more seconds. You know, I mean, you should have seen yourself. You were all smiling and happy. Just remembering that confidence. You know, maybe you grew the perfect tomato and you presented it to your neighbor who you're competing with secretly, and you're growing tomatoes, and you knew that your tomato was better than his tomato. You know, uh, it, it just really makes us feel good. Um, well, that will come up later. I had a hard time with this passage. In fact, this passage, today's passage in 1 John 4, 13 to 21, is kind of the reason why <laughs> I neglected 1 John for many, many years of my life. Uh, this read especially very poetically. A lot of the things would require reading and rereading and slow reading and analysis. I even had to diagram the whole thing, okay? Um, and, and I worked on it and I didn't crack it until late Friday night. I've never started writing a sermon manuscript that late, but I didn't start writing until Saturday morning. <laughs> um, but, but because it just wouldn't open to me. It wouldn't speak to me. They were just words. And so I kept at it, and it finally opened. And one of the things that I insist on doing is keeping it in context. But especially here, because 13 to 21 is part of a larger section about love. It started with last week's sermon from verses 7 to 12. And I'd like to just kind of remind us a few of those points before we go on. Uh, we talked about the calling that God gives to Christians to love. And it talked about what kind of love it is to be, that it had three specific things when we talk about authentic grace love. First, this love needed to be expressed, okay? That authentic grace love just felt is not good enough, so it needed to be expressed. Number two, it had to have a recipient. Okay? Uh, it's not good enough to love the world and hate individuals. Okay? But you've got to have specific objects of this love. And then finally, the thing that separates it from all of the Hallmark and all of the country western songs is this love must benefit the person being loved. Those were the three things. So there's the calling to love and what this love is is all about. And, you know, to the credit of this congregation, on Sunday after that sermon, Perry went out and applied it. Because one of our sisters had problems at her house, Perry went over there not once, but twice, and he got it resolved. So he expressed it. He didn't say, oh, I feel bad for you. Okay? Uh, but he took action. And he went out and helped this specific person, which means dealing with this specific person's real problem. And then fixing it and thus 
benefiting this person, something like that. And so this is what we're called to do, and uh, this is an important thing. And, you know, let me say this. When I grew up, we had the sense that calling was about what we do. You're going to be a pastor? They asked me when I was in high school. I said, no, I want to be a scientist. Okay? But we were very, very clear about doing something in our profession or marrying the right person, that kind of stuff. But really, when the Bible talks about calling, you know, and the will of God, the passage comes to me where it says, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Meaning, even your development as a human being and as a believer. So it has to do with character and values and virtue. And so that's why we have this calling to love. And this is a calling that everybody can do. Because not everybody has a choice on who they're going to marry. Not everybody has a choice about what kind of work and profession they are going to do. But each and every one of us can make the choice to be a loving person, to be able to express grace love in these tangible ways. And so that was the first half. Now we come to verses 13. And what we want to do is put up, Aaron, let's put up 1 John 4, 12. Because 1 John 4, 12 is a kind of a pivot verse or a hinge verse. In other words, it ends the first half of the passage, but it leads us directly into the rest of the passage. It says they're going to see God if we love one another. And then it closes by saying, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And the rest of this section about love uh, from, um, from 13 to 21 is first about God abiding in us and then about his love being perfected in us. Okay? So uh, we have this, and uh, it uh, moves into that. And the idea of God abiding us, we're going to talk about, and the point and, and how God abides in us and how we abide in God. And then when it says his love is perfected, uh, we're going to see that whereas before it was always using the phrase perfected in us, we're going to see that when we get into this part, it talks about perfected with us. Okay, and that's different. So um, so let's move into that, and we're going to examine it bit by bit. So, um, Aaron, let's put up verse 13. Okay, let's read it together. All right? One, two, three. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And it's talking about how this abiding is possible and how it works. And the first thing that makes it possible and makes it real and begins its happening is what? According to this verse. What has God done? What has he given us? Who has he given us? Which person of the Godhead has he given to us? Okay. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> okay. So, so that we are. Okay. And so when, when Jesus says, Lo, I am with you always, and he could include a ye or Yerkes, okay, it's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit in us is God already abiding in us. So God has already begun the process. And so we have him, and I, I, I and this is always given in that not only does God abide in us, but who needs to abide in God? We have to abide in him. Classic illustration from the Chinese restaurant. The man is sitting there, and he's reading his Chinese newspaper. The wife is sitting there, and what is she doing? 
She's shopping on Amazon. Okay? I saw this up in Vancouver. <laughs> Not around here. Was either person abiding with each other? No, they were engaged separately. And so, when God says we must abide in him as he abides in us, it talks about actual active engagement, to be with one another, keeping company with God and being actively engaged. One day, Jesus was um, walking behind two discouraged disciples because Jesus had just been crucified, and they were feeling bad, and they were headed toward the town called Emmaus, and Jesus caught up with them. And he started to talk to them, and he opened up the scriptures to them. And you know what? They said, wow, this is really good. And when they got to the town, it says, Jesus made as if he was going to keep on walking. But what did those two disciples do? This is Jesus, don't go yet. Let us sit down and eat together so that we may continue our sharing. And so as they continued their sharing, their eyes finally became fully opened. You know, it wasn't the lentil soup. It wasn't the pita bread. It was the discussion of the scriptures. And that's how we do it today. The Spirit is in there to work to remind us of what Jesus has said. He is in there to open our eyes to the Word of God. Just like I have to work five days, maybe six, because sometimes I start my sermon preparation Sunday night. I have to work of that long to be actively engaged with God, to get clarity so that these are not just words, blah, 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 blah. And let's face it, a lot of times we come to the Bible and what? Blah, 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 blah. And then we leave. But I stayed with it, and then it finally opened. And we read it so that we can get it into not only our mind, but into our heart. That we would learn God. Learn God, his mind, his will, his ways, his very heart. Okay? We tend to look for the rules, but I tell you there's a better way because God can't answer everything in the Bible. But the more we know him implicitly, the more we trust, the more we can relate. And so uh, we take it And we ask God, we pray, and we let him use his word. And then we abide back after he opens it up, and we adjust our lives. We adjust our values. We adjust our behaviors. And it becomes an ongoing process of engagement and transformation for us. And as we do this, like I said last week, The more you hang with somebody, the more you start to look and sound like that person, the more we come like God. And as I said last week, God is love. And so Ken is love should be my goal. And I said, put your name in there and see how it sounds. X is love. Put in your name. And are you becoming that kind of a loving thing? That this is our calling. And what I've found over the years is the more I grapple with the passage, and let me tell you, I've been trying to understand abiding since about 1987. Okay? Now, it's not always going to be that hard. And for you, it'll probably go a lot quicker. But see, little by little, you chip away and you get new understanding, a new appreciation, a new application, and change. But it's over 
time. We want instant growth, but we're human beings. We are not a product that comes off an assembly line. So it's got to take time. And it's good that it takes time because then it becomes real. We can adapt to it. We can adjust to it. And it doesn't break us in the process because there was too much strain put on the process. And so we abide with him. It's kind of reading the scriptures this way, kind of like back in the old days when people communicated over distance using what? Anybody remembers? The mail. (laughs) Thank you, Mark. We used the mail. And the whole idea of using mail was that you can take this letter and you can read it over several times and you can absorb it and really understand what was she saying? What did she mean? How did she feel when she said this to me? Am I in or out? You know? And you think about it and then you don't rush back with a reply. You give it a few days and make sure you come back to it and you still get that same impression. Then you write back. You don't rush the communication. And over time, you develop a real correspondence of communication. And that's what we do with the scriptures. To be able to read it with the help of the Holy Spirit and come to experience it and let it change us. Now, verse 14 and 15, we'll take it together. And so as we have abided with him uh, and uh, the Holy Spirit is helping us, then it brings us to the point where we can do three things. We can see, then we can testify, and then in the next verse, um, we can have uh, verse 15 says, confess. So you see, you testify, and you confess. Meaning, our salvation becomes very real. That you understand it. And you go through the process of becoming a Christian, and thus you testify. And then when we get to the part where we confess, this is a very deep word, expressing our soul. We are really acknowledging that we understand him. And so the Holy Spirit is doing this work and we grow in understanding our God and we become more like him. And the thing that we come to really know is we come to understand his love, his grace love. You know, after being a Christian for all of my adult life, starting in my teens, I've come to the sad conclusion that most Christians only barely understand grace. We barely understand it as a get-out-of-jail-free card. But it's much more than that. It's much deeper than that. There is a generosity about it that we have barely come to scratch the surface and it comes, this kind of understanding comes when we abide with God and when we have abided with him, then you know what? When we read words like, if somebody slaps you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. If somebody makes you go a mile, go an extra mile. We're not going to say, what? We're going to say, oh, I understand. Oh, I'm willing to do it. You know? If I, as a Christian, understand it, I'll listen to a Democrat when he's telling me his beliefs. You know? It's grace because very practical. And when we have understood it, and we have lived it, and we really appreciate it, we can give it to others. And that's 
when we have understood this thing called grace. You know, Jesus taught a parable. He says, there's a guy who's planting seeds and he's sowing. And some of these seeds fall on the hard ground and they don't go into the dirt and the birds come and take it away. There's another set of seeds that fall in the shallow ground and they spring up quickly, but, you know, no roots. So the sun scorches it. And there's another group of seeds that fall in and they start to grow. But you know what? They encounter the thorns and the thistles and these things choke it out because the plant isn't strong enough. But there is another batch of seeds that not only bear fruit, but an abundance of harvest. These are the John 15, abide in Christ believers. And when we come to know grace, God's grace love, in that way, we are strong enough to endure any kind of hardship, any kind of persecution, any kind of trial and demand. And not only do we benefit ourselves in that we don't feel a fear of judgment, but we can give it to others. Jesus says, you know what? By this shall the world know that you are my disciples if you do what? Love one another. When he prayed in John 17 to the Father in his longest prayer of the Bible, he was doing his performance review. He says, Father, here it is. Here's my 33 years of life and my three years of ministry. And I've done it. And everything you wanted me to do, everything you wanted me to say, everything you were doing, I jumped in there and I did it. And he had no fear of judgment because he understood the God of grace love. See, when we can get to the point where people look at us and say, yeah, they do love one another. It's not just the world knows that we are disciples, but it's because God says, just like Jesus could stand before me and pray with the freedom of confidence that he had done what I need. So when you are able to love one another and you are truly my disciple, and that's what the whole Great Commission is about. Your performance review will be okay. You know, you got two choices, right? You got to either buddy up to the supervisor and let him beat you at golf, okay? Or you can figure out what he wants and do it, and do it excellently. And when you've got that, you can have those times of performance review and you're not going to worry about it. You're going to have every confidence. Okay, we're running out of time. Let us look at verses 19 to 21. And, um, oh, we've got to look at verse 17 first. Okay? Uh, uh, no, let's go back to 16. Sorry, Aaron. Okay, I owe you a milkshake. All right. uh, verse 16. So we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. Not just know, but believe. That's our problem. That's what I mean when I say we only scratch the surface of grace. We know about it, but we have not deeply believed. God is love. This is the second time John says this, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Verse 17 And by this is love perfected with us. And what he wants is not that I'm just loving in a monastery. He wants us to be loving in a community. And I so appreciate the diversity of our community because it challenges us 
because your culture, your background, your family has some elements that irritate me. <laughs> Just like I have from my race, from my upbringing, and from my family, do certain things that irritate you. It happens even at home with my wife. And we're very similar. But only in the irritation do you get to do what? Grace, love. Right? Anybody can love their clone. But to love people who are different, that's grace, love. So, anyway, uh, where are we? 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Verse 19. We love because he first loved us. 20. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar, but he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. What happened was they had the Gnostics who came into the church in that day, and they took a bunch of Christians out, saying, we're smarter, we got a better theory, we got the PhDs, and we can tell you uh, a brand new 2.0 version of the gospel. And they destroy the body, and they're hating, but they says, we love God. And John says, no, you don't. Okay? Because if God is in your brother, and if you're loving God, who do you got to love? Yeah. He says, so, you're fooling yourself. You're in denial. You're fantasizing. Verse uh, 21. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God, and John now not only makes it into a single commandment, but he puts it in its most forceful form, must also love his brother. And so that's the call of this passage. Um, you know, two things, uh, maybe three. Let's seek to love with grace, love. Let it be expressed. Let it find a beneficiary and let it be beneficial. Second, we need to learn to embrace grace love by learning how to abide. And the challenge is, how do we read our Bible? Do we stay with it until he speaks to us? Just read it over and over, praying, and he eventually will open up and speak to you, and you will come to know the reality of God's love, its breadth, its height, its depth, its grace. And then finally, bring it into the community like you're already doing so well. So uh, again, add prayers to your readings. When God speaks to you, engage him back. And remember the assignment from last week? Who? in your sphere of love can you reach out to? Somebody whom you haven't seen for a while, a relative you have neglected, maybe somebody you know is having a hard time at work, maybe someone in your neighborhood. Exemplify love by making it real in that person's life. Do something to benefit them. That's the challenge of this passage. And the value is, not only we don't have fear in judgment, not only do we have confidence in judgment, but basically we'll really, really, really be tight with the boss. Hey, that's pretty good. Let's pray. Lord, it's a tremendous subject, so deep, so great, when we talk about your grace, because we just don't experience it in this world. We live in a world where self-centeredness and ego is primary. But for somebody who is willing to keep giving, even when despised, 
Uh, it just goes counter to all of our experience, all of our background, all of our fallen nature inclination. And that's why we need, in the first place, your Holy Spirit working within. So thank you for that first most precious gift. Work out your will in our lives. Help us to respond to our one calling to love with grace love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.